Eddie. Mm. If you're in the olden times, what, what would you do? Which olden times? Like uh, King Arthur with knights and horses and shit. Oh, I'd be the king. No, you can't be king, dog. You're, you're a peasant. Peasant. If you were king, I'd kill myself. But you better die, brother. Because I'm the king around these parts. Director Gia Coppola's 2013 debut, Palo Alto, is a fascinating film to examine. A glimpse into the lives and misadventures of four teenagers aging out of high school and into proper young adulthood, the film is moving and uncomfortable and really strange in parts, but above all just tremendously authentic. Which in and of itself is kind of a small miracle. A bunch of second and third generation celebrity kids got together and made a movie with James Franco. Palo Alto has absolutely no business being as real as it is, but it's it is. It captures that sense of urgency and tragedy and danger and high drama that we experience moving out of our teens and into our early 20s, and it does so in a way that I think is really worth unpacking. And when I say it's uncomfortable, I mean that in a few ways, but primarily in how the film really organically conveys the awkwardness of those late teen years. Our first exposures to drinking and driving and dating and screwing and all these other thoroughly adult arenas we step into during our final years of what could still be called childhood. The film the film has a deep understanding of how exciting, desperately so, these things can be, but never losing that sense of tension, even danger, that comes with it. Receiving sexual attention from people you still see as authority figures, being accountable to law enforcement in new ways, not having control of your faculties, or being able to trust the intentions of those around you. And that's not even getting into the James Franco of it all. The film is loosely adapted from Palo Alto Stories, a collection of shorts based on experiences from Franco's childhood, and while I won't pretend the book is some undiscovered masterpiece, like the film, it does capture this certain something about late adolescence that's very hard to recreate. In particular, Coppola's praised the book's female chapters as being very authentic to what she experienced growing up, because if there's one thing James Franco knows, it's teenage girls. The film is more reserved than the book, but in my opinion, also more effective at what it sets out to do, and I think a lot of this is in the way the character building was done. Drawing heavily from the teenage coming-of-age stories she grew up on, most notably the virgin suicides, Coppola worked closely with each of the actors in bringing their own personalities and perspectives into the four main kids. Emily, Teddy, April, and Fred. They all stayed in the same house while shooting the film, and I think living and working so closely with each other, and in particular working under a director who is both very young herself and very willing to give her actors the leeway to personalize their roles, went a long way in making the adolescent experiences depicted in this film feel so genuine. For this process with teenagers, it felt like they knew what was up to date more than I did. After a certain point, they knew the characters better than I did. So I was really just open to their suggestions and what they brought to the table. They all had a great relationship, and I didn't want to get in the way of that. Everyone has their own approach to making a movie, but I view it as collaborative. Everyone I talk to comes out of this movie feeling a tremendous sense of either relief or sorrow for the past, or both, I guess, depending on how warmly you remember your teen years. I don't know if I'd call it brilliant, but it's very real, in a very raw and earnest way that maybe only a debut film can be. All of these characters are in a state of flux, but I think the one most aware of it is April. She knows this is a particular time in her life and that it's coming to a close, and there's a sadness to that awareness, but also a tranquility, a sense of purpose or at least trajectory none of the others have. Her interactions with the story are passive, playing the detached observer, sitting apart from her peers, watching and listening more than engaging. I'd also say April is the one who feels most like a stand-in for the director. They have the same bedroom, the same mother, and her sense of alienation of just being so over her surroundings is reflective of Coppola's dissatisfaction with the teen film landscape at the time. I was personally longing for a movie about teenagers, one that felt realistic, and I was kind of disappointed and what was out there until very recently. They all have perfect hair and skin, and don't curse or smoke cigarettes, and the actors are older. And you look on the streets now, and teenagers are just so much more interesting. I think all movies and TV shows and video games these days are just pointless. 
All of the adults in April's life are useless as sources of guidance, to the point where she's basically the most mature character in the film, which ironically is what alienates her from people her own age and leaves her vulnerable to manipulation by the comparatively juvenile Coach B. Before we unpack the rest of April's story, by the way, I do have to point out how strange it is for James Franco to be playing this particular role. Because it was around the time of the film's completion that Franco was caught trying to hook up with a teenager in real life after some DMs leaked of him asking a 17-year-old girl back to his hotel room. Which, while not technically illegal, as 17 is the age of consent in New York, is still pretty sketchy behavior from a then 35-year-old who was in a position where he could basically hook up with any adult woman he wanted. When asked about this in interviews for Palo Alto, Coppola replied only that she considers it irrelevant, though more has come out since, both from past partners and students of the now-defunct Studio 4 acting school accusing Franco of sexually coercive or exploitative behavior. So I don't know if I'd call playing a high school coach who can't stop sleeping with his teenage students irrelevant, especially in a film this personal. If anything, it makes me think of, like, how James Wood's character had a basement full of Nazi planes in The Virgin Suicides, but that's another video. Maybe she's just buttering me up. I don't know. She's like, James, you're my favorite actor, and I really would like you to play Mr. B. And um, I like, oh, God. Because, you know, because that character is in the book is very, is, is based on somebody real, loosely based, you know. Um, this guy was caught, and he was uh, in this relationship with a girl that was much younger than the character that Emma plays, she was like 13. And it all came out later, like years later, and he got arrested and went to prison. So I felt really weird about playing this guy, and, um, but I you know, wanted to do whatever I could to support the movie, and um, so I said, all right. <laughs> and the way to play it, you know, I just thought, um, the context is gonna make it creepy, you know, and so I don't, you know, need to add any creep on it. Like the way to make it even scarier is just like, this guy thinks he's in a normal kind of romantic situation. And so as an actor, just play it like that. Like he thinks the feelings between them are so deep that he's above the law or whatever. So, um, so I, you know, I just played it like any kind of, romance. The film definitely ascribes a lot of sexual agency to April, and there's this theme of inappropriate or boundary-crossing behavior traveling down the generational ladder, so I could see how, especially with the character having been based on someone Franco knew growing up, one could read the story as normalizing the kind of mentality that might lead a 35-year-old man to think hooking up with a teenager is okay. April is obviously not getting the fulfillment she needs from her home life, and that makes her very vulnerable and susceptible to Mr. B's character, who is kind of stunted emotionally. He just can't connect with someone his own age, so they're kind of a perfect fit. She's not really being treated the way she wants to be treated, and he's able to give her that. He genuinely loves her. April, I love you. Makes sense. Even the direction seems confused about April at times, but overall I feel the film makes it pretty clear she's being manipulated by a predatory authority figure. And the sex scene itself is very uncomfortable, emphasizing how childish April still is, despite all her maturity. It was Emma Roberts' idea to put the days of the week on the underwear, by the way, keep that in mind. A lot of the film is about these kids being plunged into sexual situations, often with untrustworthy people that they don't have the experience or maturity to deal with. Controlling her engagement with this element is something that's very important to April's character, and I think this is shown in an interesting way during the, uh, cat mask titty sequence? Come on, enough of this game. Let's watch a movie. this movie. Why? It's a good movie. I 
I had so many questions watching this scene, because April clearly sets this up on purpose, so the first thing they see is the boob shot from Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And then she's watching the kid for his reaction rather than the screen and shuts things down right after the nudity is over. Why? What's April getting out of this, and why are they wearing cat masks? Well, as I said, a lot of this movie is about sex, and how we experience that as our bodies and minds may be maturing at different rates. And there's this thing about cats and sex. For those who don't know, adult cats have barbed spines on their penises, which make the act of mating very painful for the cat being, uh, barbed. And while we lost our dick spines over 700,000 years ago, sex still has the potential to be painful for humans as well, emotionally, psychologically, and even physically, especially at the age most of the kids in this movie are. So they're wearing these masks, and she's watching him watch the sex movie, and then pulls things back after she gets something out of his reaction. I think this is April's way of engaging with the male sex element in a safe way that she has control over, and that she knows isn't going to get out of hand or go anywhere because he's just a kid. Cats aren't born with the dick hooks after all, they're reliant on testosterone and don't show up until puberty. Maybe it was the Virgin Suicide's influence, but I could never quite escape the feeling, watching Palo Alto, that something bad could happen at any moment. And some bad things do happen, but the sense of tension, like there's another shoe waiting to drop, never quite leaves us. I've heard people suggest that the scene where Fred's father pretty overtly hits on Teddy might be indicating Fred himself was sexually abused, but I don't know if I agree. Mostly because, according to the director, it was Chris Messina's idea to play the scene that way, and he more or less came up with it on the spot. So I don't think the script was implying that Fred was sexually abused, but that doesn't necessarily mean the film isn't. There's an expression in filmmaking that you tell the story three times. Once when you write it, again when you shoot it, and then one more time when you edit that footage into the final movie. So much of film criticism right now, especially on YouTube, is heavily text-based, but a movie isn't a novel. It tells its story differently, in different ways, and every step in this process is equally important in bringing that final project to fruition. It goes through so many different changes and filtrations from what I wrote to what the actors brought, and just the daily grind of the challenges you face making a movie to the edit. That one blueprint idea takes on its own life. Especially in film, it's such a collaborative thing that you've got to be willing to accept that it becomes something else than you initially intended, but it's not worse than what you intended. I think, as it was written, this scene was meant to portray Fred's father as just another shitty L.A. parent, getting high in the middle of the living room, smoking with a minor. It shows the lack of adult stability in Fred's life, so then Messina's idea adds this extra layer of he's also a creep who hits on his kid's friend and does it in this very strategic way that can be played off as intoxicated randomness. It's a weird scene I would definitely describe as more organic than meticulously plotted. This wasn't just Jack Kilmer's first role in a movie, this was his first time time acting, and I think being guided by a director he's known and trusted since she was his babysitter brought a lot of the authenticity out in his performance. Movies are a collaboration, and I was working with a wonderful actor, Chris Messina, and we kind of, there was a scene in the book that was similar to this, but we took it to a whole nother level of like, you know, he said, why don't I hit on Jack Kilmer? And I said, that's great, but I'm not going to tell him. And so all of that kind of was very authentic and Jack felt very uncomfortable. And authentic is the word I would use to describe Teddy, because the truth is, as a performer, Jack isn't operating on the same level as Nat Wolf or Emma Roberts. But to be honest, I think his lack of acting experience actually kind of works as an expression of Teddy's adolescent discomfiture. All of the other characters represent these grand, romantic emotions we associate with that time in our lives, the angst, the loneliness, the anger that stands out in our memories. But Jack quite earnestly captures the inherent awkwardness and confusion that defines the day-to-day -day life of a teenager. Teddy's story is about this kid trying to grow up in a very aimless way and being pushed and pulled by all these different, often opposing forces he doesn't entirely understand. Jack Kilmer being such a raw talent and having this close, personal relationship with the director is important because a major aspect of Teddy's story involves the influence that people can have on our lives, especially through the very formative period covered by this film. Which brings us to the man of the hour. Try not to hang around Fred. Dude, Fred, you can't be here. Why not? I miss you. With respect to Emma and Jack and Zoe Levine, Nat Wolf 
absolutely steals the show here. Fred is crazy and contemptible and confused and compelling and just so thoroughly human. James Franco's described Fred and Teddy respectively as his inner darkness and then the part that wants to do better. Coppola puts it in more cinematic terms, analogizing the two boys and their dynamic to Robert De Niro and Harvey Keitel's characters in Mean Streets, wherein you have the one person who's maybe not on the right side of the law per se, but trying to do the right thing, and another who's just this unrepentant, unstoppable force of chaos in their life. Johnny Boy blows up every chance he's given in Mean Streets, almost like he can't help himself, dragging Charlie down with him every step of the way, and when his inevitable crash finally comes, he's not the only one who gets hurt. My aunt always stressed the importance of who your friends were at that age, and it really can mold what you do with that very fragile part of your life. Fred is the sort of character that eventually something is going to happen to him if he keeps acting the way he does. There's always that one friend who parents are like, don't hang out with that person. Just like De Niro in Mean Streets, Fred is a constant source of disruption and chaos in the lives of those around him, with this sense of foreboding that he's eventually going to bring them all to some kind of disaster. The film opens on him deliberately smashing his car into a wall with his best friend in the passenger seat. He shows up at Ted's community service job and gets him in trouble, alienates his wider friend circle with his obnoxious antics, uses and degrades Emily with basically no thought for her feelings or well-being. One of the darkest scenes in Palo Alto is this pretty chilling voiceover from Fred describing an afternoon when he got Emily drunk and high and convinced her to have sex with a bunch of his friends. It's another strange segment and people seem divided on how much we're really supposed to believe what Fred's saying. The first time I watched the movie, I assumed he was lying. It's the only point in the film where a voiceover is used and this is also just the exact sort of thing teenage boys are always lying about. And there's a kind of artificiality to the way Fred presents himself we'll get into in a moment, but upon subsequent viewings I have noticed certain details that indicate something happened Emily didn't like and she feels used by. Come on! All those things I hate! Come on! Come on! Set me up! Sick and disgusting! Emily's story is based on a series of chapters in the novel called Chinatown, about a teenage girl being manipulated by her boyfriend into having sex with a bunch of strangers. It's a fairly bizarre, tone-breaking segment of the story that either Franco completely invented, which feels vaguely fetishy, or it's actually based on real sexual abuse that a childhood acquaintance of his went through, which, given how the book was advertised, is so much worse. When asked about this scene in interviews, Coppola said she wants it to be a little ambiguous, but in my opinion, also seems to imply that Fred's story is at least partially true. I like the, the kind of, I guess, mystery of whether or not it happened and, and leaving it up to the audience to kind of have their own interpretation of, of what they think was going on. And, and yeah, but I mean, that stuff goes on and so it's, it's dark. But the question I find more interesting than which sexual details may or may not have happened is what either interpretation says about Fred's character. Because in general, it really doesn't seem like he gets any satisfaction out of being with Emily at all. She's just something for him to use as a prop, but telling people, showing people, or making them a part of the big show he's putting on, that's important to him. Get it, boy! I've been excited about this! Just get in, okay? See, there's a performativity to Fred's character and a constant need for validation that I think will be related or at least recognizable to a lot of like YouTubers or actors or comedians. Everything he does is loud and in your face in a way that demands attention. In the opening party scene, he's hammering uh, what appear to be bullets into the floor while Teddy and April are trying to have a conversation. Why are you doing that? Do you mind your own business? It's my stepbrother. He acts annoyed by the interruption, but the attention is also what mollifies him and makes him stop what he's doing. Because Fred is always playing to an audience. You could say he's overacting the part of someone who doesn't give a fuck. Now, remembering that he's described Fred as at least partially autobiographical, it's worth taking a moment here to consider the sort of artist James Franco is, particularly regarding his philosophy on performance art. I'll point to an op-ed he wrote for the Times in 2014, commenting on some of Shia LaBeouf's bizarre public behavior. 
any artist, regardless of his field, can experience distance between his true self and his public persona. But because film actors typically experience fame in greater measure, our personas can feel at the mercy of forces far beyond our control. Our rebellion against the hand that feeds us can instigate a frenzy of commentary that sets in motion a feedback loop. Acting out, followed by negative publicity, followed by acting out in response to that publicity, followed by more publicity, and so on. Participating in this call and response is a kind of critique, a way to show up the media by allowing their oversized responses to essentially trivial actions to reveal the emptiness of their raison d'etre. Believe me, this game of peekaboo can be very addictive. I notice he also throws himself into a lot of roles like Tommy Wiseau or The Wizard in Oz the Great and Powerful that blur the lines between con artist, filmmaker, and whimsical pussyhound. And you can argue the degree to which this all works, but whatever else there is to say about the man, James Franco is a person who very much believes in embracing performativity. To the point where back when the whole uh, teenage sex DM thing happened, a lot of people actually wondered if maybe he was doing it to like drum up support for the movie or because he got too into the character. Or something. Which, to be clear, he was not, but one could be forgiven for wondering at the time. Fred's whole personality is this loud, exaggerated performance because whether he knows it or not, most of his actions are meant to distract from something, maybe even to distract himself. And that something, in my opinion, is that he's gay. It's very subtle. I mean, don't you ever get jealous of those girls in pornos that get to be on their knees in the middle of all those fucking dicks. But if you look closely, the evidence is there. For one, he doesn't seem to get any enjoyment at all out of his relationship with Emily, sexual or otherwise. In fact, it kind of looks like he flinches a little when she takes him in her mouth during the blowjob scene. Contrast this with how disproportionately attached he is to Teddy. He follows him to his community service job and his art classes, he gets angry and possessive whenever April's around, and when he's hurt and vulnerable at the end of the movie, Teddy is the person he goes looking for. This is the one day I can. Sorry. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. You bet. I don't even want to hang out with you. You're boring as shit. All you do is fucking work and just... Where's Teddy? <clears throat> Why does everybody always ask about Teddy? Seriously. I don't know. You're always with him. He follows me around. What am I supposed to do? I'm not a rude person. The scene in Emily's bedroom just before they have sex for the first time is actually very illustrative of the general way Fred acts out to cover up for his feelings. Emily asks about Teddy, commenting on how close the two of them seem, which Fred immediately gets super defensive about. Then he looks around the room, as if for a distraction, spots the guitar, picks it up, and starts singing her name loud and out of tune while strumming it incoherently. Nat Wolf is actually a talented musician, you know. He's playing guitar and singing poorly on purpose because he didn't want Emily to keep asking him about Ted. Whether this is because he didn't want to think about it or because he didn't want her to think about it isn't entirely clear. But the fact that he moves in to have sex with her immediately after the guitar bit makes me think on at least some level this is Fred trying to prove something to himself. Now two years after Palo Alto, James Franco interviewed um, himself for 429 Magazine where he talks about having questioned his own sexuality in the past and identifying as performatively queer. So I ask myself, are you fucking gay or what? And I like to think that I'm gay in my art and straight in my life. Although, I'm also gay in my life up to the point of intercourse, and then you could say I'm straight. So, I guess it depends on how you define gay. If it means who you have sex with, I guess I'm straight. God, I can't believe Zoe Kravitz got in trouble for saying she played Catwoman as queer while James Franco has just been running amok for years. Anyway, Fred being gay is just my reading, but what's important is the way he adopts this exaggerated persona to cover up what he's feeling inside. When he's trying to psych Skull and Teddy out with the knife, that's him being hurt and insecure and trying to reclaim something. At first I thought he collapses in tears because his act failed to have the effect he wanted, but what I think really happens is Fred is drunk and high and probably a little bit concussed and he gets his wires crossed. He lets the mask slip and reveals more of himself than he wanted to. When he realizes what he did, that's when he breaks down in tears. What sets him all the way off in the end is finally being called out on his performativity, the revelation that the people close to him could see through his act all along, and who knows what else they can see. Why do you have to be all fucking crazy and psycho on me? Why do you have to try so fucking hard to seem crazy, man? I don't get it. <laughs> This final, likely suicidal outburst is foreshadowed earlier in the film in a kind of abstract scene with Teddy's art teacher. I say to myself, Bob, you're going down the tunnel of death. 
And I said to myself, my name's not Bob. I'm not Bob. And I said, it's not my car. And this is not my tunnel. So what happened? I made a Yui, and suddenly I'm going fast the other way, and there's a rainbow. It's a rainbow. You're going down the wrong way, Bob. Turn your art around. Dude, I'm, I'm not Bob. Yes, yes. No, All right. I'm not. That's right. I'm not yeah. fucking Bob. Yes. The teacher's telling a story about turning his life around when he realized he was on a destructive path, what he calls his death tunnel. Also worth noting is that when he turns around, the first thing he sees is a rainbow, something the film itself later identifies as a symbol of queerness. Rainbows are gay, get it? So? Don't get all defensive about it, it's just a fact. Even the rainbow gremlins are gay as fuck. Yeah. Fuck you, dude. They're, They're a time. bunch of awesome. dudes, and they just hang out all the time, all together. That's all they do, is just fucking hang out. That's exactly what we do. Fred responds to this observation by drawing a penis in the book. At the end of the movie, Fred's in his own death tunnel, but instead of turning around, he just accelerates straight into the oncoming headlights. I'm not Bob means this isn't who I am, but Fred didn't understand the story, and he uses the expression like he's spitting it back at the world for trying to make him conform, as a statement of rebellion against everyone else rather than his own self-imposed delusions. I was gonna kill myself. Kill a bunch of other people, take him down with me. I wouldn't waste it. Fred would rather die and probably hurt or kill a bunch of strangers along the way than live as the person he really is. Any catharsis in his story's resolution comes from Emily and then Ted finally cutting him loose before it's too late. In a lot of ways, the film's closing moments feel like Gia Coppola fixing her source material. What if the girl from Chinatown had just cracked that manipulative creep in the head with a bottle? What if Charlie had left Johnny Boy to deal with his own problems and gone out of town with his girl instead? This isn't to say Palo Alto is unsympathetic towards Fred, I think he has the most sincere moment of pathos in the film, and I wouldn't have spoken about him as long as I have if there weren't something very compelling about the character. Nat Wolf easily delivers the strongest performance here, and there is something very appealing Feeling, especially to youth about characters who are just pure id, right? But the truth is, Fred's the opposite of that. Everything he does is characterized by performance, to the point where he's internalized the mask and doesn't even realize he's wearing it anymore. Palo Alto has a lot to say, often indirectly, about the performativity of life, and of change, and how our lives and experiences represent this very unique flavor that we bring with us into collaborative art forms like film. You can say so much just by observing a character's room. We shot Jack Kilmer's bedroom in his actual bedroom, and then April's was just my old bedroom that my mom had left the same. And with Emily, it was important to show the dynamic that just a few years ago, she was playing with toys, and now she's kind of playing with boys. All the kids lived at my mom's house while we were shooting because they had to get up so early and go home so late. My mom was working on a movie behind the scenes, so she would make the dinner at night. I would go over there and have dinner with them. My mom plays Emma's mom in the movie. Those are Gia Coppola's own virgin suicides posters in April's bedroom that have been hanging there since she grew up looking at them, thinking about the film that would go on to be such a tremendous influence on her own feature debut. James Franco played the villain in Homefront just to fund this movie, adapted from stories based on his own childhood, and God only knows what he did to get into character. There's this image I think a lot of us have of the auteur, this god emperor of the set with a perfect vision of what they want every frame to look like, who has to bully a certain type of film into existence, wring it from their cast violently if need be. We like to idolize the Kubricks, the Hitchcocks, the Tarantinos, and while there is a conversation to be had about when certain behavior makes progress in art and when it's abusive and counterproductive, they certainly have their place in film canon. But I think too often we overlook the Gia Coppolas of the world, whose creation creative philosophies focus more on bringing the story out of those she's working with than in twisting them into the shapes her vision requires. Palo Alto isn't a perfect film, you could even say it's unethical in some ways. It's raw, and arguably already dated by the complete lack of social media, and to be honest, a little nepotistic. But it's also real in a way so many films try and so few manage to be, and this authenticity is owed in large part to the extreme emphasis that the director placed on collaboration with the rest of her creative team. I always say that it was, it's like a filtration, I mean it goes from my, uh, James's book to uh, my writing and then to the actors and they start to know the characters better than I do and and I enjoyed all those sort of moments when uh, 
they kept the scenes fresh and surprised me and brought new things to the table. And um, I just tried to be open and honest. And, and I, I, I liked hearing what they know the characters better than me, so I liked hearing. Palo Alto is like a coming of age story for 90s kids in their 20s. I won't pretend it's another Stand By Me or Virgin Suicides, but it doesn't have to be. Palo Alto is unique and fascinating in its own right, as different from the things that inspired it as one season of our lives is from another. Thank you for watching. Keeping with the theme of this video, I want to make sure to thank my own collaborators, Joshua Lozano for providing the voice of James Franco, and Style is Substance for voicing Gia Coppola, as well as for introducing me to this movie. I'd also like to thank my patrons for helping me fund these videos. Your support really does make a difference, and it gives me the little bit of free time I need to make videos like this one. And we do have a question from Patreon this week. Crown of Eyes asks, Hope this isn't too personal. What kind of education do you have to make such comprehensive and insightful video essays? Is it all raw talent? Well, that is a very flattering question, Crown of Eyes, thank you. I have a bachelor's degree in political science, which, to be honest, is not super useful on the job market. I mean, I wouldn't say I regret my education, it's definitely affected the way I think about the world in a useful way, but it's not very applicable to what I'm doing right now beyond, like, it taught me how to write an essay. Looking back, it'd probably have done me more good in terms of video essays if I had gone to film school or even just majored in English, but, you know, the consensus really seems to be that a lot of what you learn in film school can be acquired for free online, and I know a lot of film grads who have to work really hard to break out of the thought patterns they pick up from their professors and find their own style after they graduate. I still think it would have been nice to just study filmmaking for four years with an organized syllabus, but that's probably a grass is always greener type situation. But thank you for asking. No offense, you have a malevolent uh, presence. You are a perfect villain.